Hello, everyone. We'll just give everybody a minute to uh, to get settled on here. Um, just uh, yeah, just give it a minute or two. Okay, hopefully, hopefully everybody's all settled. Um, and if not, that's okay. I'll uh, I'll get started on our introduction, and um, and then we can take off. Um, so, hello everyone, and welcome to the Invasive Species Asian Carp Canada webinar series. Um, my name is Jenna White. My pronouns are she/her, and I'm the Policy and Program Development Intern at the Invasive Species Center, where I also work on our Asian Carp Canada program. I'm thrilled to be your moderator today on this beautiful Monday afternoon, uh, speaking on the status of black carp in the United States. Um, so while Invasive Species Centre is located in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, I'm speaking to you from Sudbury, which is the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory and the traditional homelands of the Atikamekshing and Anishinaabek. Uh, having lived here since time immemorial, Indigenous peoples are the original stewards of this land, and I would respectfully acknowledge their long history of community and identity in these areas. Um, as a settler descendant, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work and live here and thank all generations of Indigenous people who have taken care of the land before. So in case you are not familiar, for some context uh, of who we are, the Invasive Species Centre is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, uh, knowledge, and technology to prevent the int introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. Um, so, so we've got a number of great resources uh, related to invasive species on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and more. Uh, so come check us out at the invasive species center.ca afterwards and you won't be disappointed. Um, Asian Carp Canada is one of several programs under the Invasive Species Center. Uh, so ACC was created to convene information on the most recent prevention technologies, early warning measures, response efforts, and the overall threat of Asian carps to the Great Lakes and beyond. This project component, the project components aim to enhance education and knowledge of Asian carps, and we do this in partnership with many agencies across Ontario. We have more great resources that you can find on our website, including recording of our webinar series, including this one, uh, species profiles, risk assessment summaries, and we also have social media channels and information sessions as well. Um, and we also have an exhibit at the Toronto Zoo. Um, so before we get started with today's webinar, there's a few things uh, that I was hoping to cover. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar, so if you have a question at any time, please type it into the question box and I will read them to our presenter afterwards. If you're having any technical difficulties, please type them as well into the question box or respond to the email found in your registration and we will try to resolve them for you. And lastly, there will be a very brief su survey following uh, the webinar, so if you could take some time to fill it out, we would really appreciate it. Um, and now for our presentation, um, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Patrick Kroboth. Um, so Patrick Kroboth is a fish biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey Columbia Environmental Research Center uh, since 2017, uh, with a research emphasis on invasive uh, fish species, uh, specifically invasive carp, and the subject of this talk, uh, black carp. And forgive me, but I will save your ears from the Latin pronunciation of the term. <laughs> um, but Patrick has completed his master's degree at Mississippi State uh, University studying larger habitats of sturgeon and has a bachelor's degree from Virginia Tech with research on invasive northern snakehead. Thank you so much for joining us today, Patrick. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Can you confirm that you see the slides? Yep, looks great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me. A um, little bit of background. This talk was requested as an update on black carp status in the United States and current research. And this is um, being given in preparation for hopefully a later presentation by Andrew Drake on the binational risk assessment. So with this talk, I, I plan to to not include a few topics, uh, particularly potential invasion pathways, which I anticipate will be covered in that binational risk assessment, and a Great Lakes centric topic such as uh, population or food web modeling. Um, some things that I do plan to discuss will be work by myself and colleagues throughout with references to individuals. Um, and then 
just starting off, I thought the best place to, to go from was, you know, what are black carp? With that, I plan on covering the, the background. This is kind of an outline here, and I'll follow this outline throughout the talk so we can kind of keep pace. But I wanted to provide some background for you, some history of use, um, identification methods, and then I'll get into the research and distribution, population parameters, ecological effects, um, some methods for detection, and then also some methods for control. So black carp are native to large rivers, rivers in eastern China and Russia, and you can see the map here on the right-hand side is uh, from Nico et al. 2005, and that's an initial biological synopsis and risk assessment on the species, and that's a very good uh, reference on this species in particular, and I'll, I'll mention that throughout the talk several times. I'll bring it up, so if you're, you're interested in kind of the base knowledge on the species, I would recommend uh, you look towards that reference, but Again, uh, the native range, large rivers in eastern China and Russia, and you can see them pictured here in blue with the Amur in the north moving south, the yellow Yangtze, Pearl, and Red River systems. Um, black carp have the ability to be fairly large-bodied fish. Um, I believe, hopefully you can see my cursor here, but this, uh, this fish is the largest that we've had reported in the United States. It's a 1,607 millimeter total length fish, uh, 52 kilograms that was collected from the Middle Mississippi River. Um, total length, if you're not familiar with fish and fish measurements, is measured from the tip of the snout to the tip of the caudal fin. And uh, I will go over on a later slide the different sections of the Mississippi River Basin and subbasins so that we're all kind of on the same page throughout the rest of the talk. Uh, but just know that this is from, from the Mississippi River, this fish is also from the Mississippi River, similar kind of area, the middle Mississippi, a 1300 millimeter total length fish. Um, this fish in the lower left, if you can see my cursor, is uh, a 1580 millimeter total length fish. It was from the Osage River in the Missouri, in the Missouri River uh, system. It's a, a major tributary. And it was uh, 51 kilograms, again, 1580 millimeters total length. So this is actually the largest uh, recreational capture that we've had reported. And then I wanted to provide this image for you just to get a general idea of, of what that length means, because everybody can be different heights, different builds, you know, a picture next to a person kind of varies, but this is a standard tailgate of a pickup truck. And you can see that this fish from, um, this is actually from the state of Mississippi and a biologist sent it to me. This fish is about the, the length of the width, length equivalent to the width of a standard tailgate. So just kind of relative size. So you can see that they do have the potential to grow to be very, fairly large. Um, so large bodied fish and with a large bodied fish, they can have a large mouth. The mouth gape is one of the limitations of a fish's ability to um, ingest prey. So they also have a special adaptation, uh, these molar form pharyngeal teeth on their, um, their pharyngeal jaw. And this is not the standard jaw teeth that you might think of. Um, in the front of the fish's mouth. This is actually an adaptation of the last gill arch. And these, these teeth are adapted for um, exerting a fairly strong bite force. And um, I, I kind of wanted to show you the orientation here. So they have a, um, the image on the upper left is one that we took and they've been studied for various purposes. Uh, this, this manuscript cited here in these images from Gibmark et al, 2015, this is actually the appropriate orientation. These are the lower um, gill arches. And you can see uh, this is a cross section from that. Gidmark looked at the functional feeding morphology of black carp um, by various methods. I wanted to show you that hopefully you can see this from my, my scan. These are some of the teeth. This is, this is a, a 36 kilogram fish, but they're arranged in a four or five pattern. And Again, the jaws on the bottom, on the roof of the mouth, they have a keratinous pad here that they use to crush uh, the prey against. So that's in that diagram, the PAD uh, acronym. These teeth are also fairly strong. They've been studied as a potential uh, engineering material and hay at all, this, the other image that I have here for the enamel. Um, so we have a, a combination of a few things. We have a fairly large body fish, powerful pharyngeal teeth, um, and combine that with the potential prey. Many of those species of mollusks are uh, imperiled. So obviously we have a concern for, for this invasive species. Uh, black carp were imported to the United States in the 1970s and 80s for use in aquaculture. 
Um, their primary use was as a biological control of snails in aquaculture. Um, those snails serve as the intermediate host for diagenetic trematodes, and those trematodes can infest aquaculture stocks, uh, for example, catfish or hybrid uh, striped bass stocks, and have an impact on those. Um, most of the research, if you look back at this or their prior use, has kind of been around the emphasis of black carp as a food fish or for that biological control of snails in aquaculture. Black carp are listed as an injurious species under the Lacey Act in 2007, and the Lacey Act is a United States regulation that prohibits the import or shipment of restricted animals, birds, fish, or plants. Um, over time, we've seen uh, escapement in the wild with increased reports from the wild, and I'll go over that in some of the later slides, but this is where I wanted to point out, uh, you know, the various sub-basins to you. And uh, so starting from the west and moving east in orange, uh, this this map is actually from an outreach material, so I'll highlight a few other sections that aren't, aren't quite shown on this, but in orange, we have the Missouri River Basin. In purple, we have the Upper Mississippi River Basin, which is also divided into the Middle Mississippi River Basin, below the confluence of the Missouri down to the confluence of the Ohio. The Ohio River here is shown as the watershed in pink. And then we have the Cumberland River in yellow and the Tennessee River in blue. Below the confluence of the Ohio is the lower Mississippi River, and that runs the length of the Mississippi from the confluence of the Ohio down to the Gulf of Mexico. And there's also some basins over here that aren't highlighted. The, the Red River here meets with the uh, uh, distributory of the Mississippi and forms the Atchafalaya River. And I'll mention that in later slides of this talk as it runs down to the Gulf of Mexico and terminates. And there's also in the state of Arkansas here, we have the Arkansas and White River systems. And they actually connect fairly closely um, to distribute into the Mississippi River. So I'm moving on to identification. Um, in working with the species for several years, we've worked with the public, a lot of commercial fishers, and that's the source of a lot of our reports. Um, we've been able to identify some of the, the commonly um, confused or misidentified species. As far as native species, blue suckers are the most commonly um, misidentified or reported. Um, blue suckers are fairly easy to differentiate. They possess a, a falcate dorsal fin and a section of the dorsal fin that runs along the length of the back. So this longer section here is always present. And from a fish biologist perspective, they have a you know, different morphology in general, somewhat elongate, um, also different mouth position, fin position, and everything else, but that's an easier um, method to differentiate um, when working with the public. We've seen a, only a few instances of buffalo being misidentified. That's just because of the size of the fish, um, that really the size of the fish is scales, but they do tend to have a deeper body in general and they're fairly easily differentiated. We don't get a lot of reports from those. Um, as far as non-native fish, which is the next column I have here, I have black carp on the top. Um, common carp is another one that comes up um, in a somewhat regular report, but you usually have a darker colored common carp. Um, they're, they're pretty easy to differentiate based on the presence of a barbel in the corner of the mouth, even though those can vary in size. There's other, some, some other uh, morphological um, methods to differentiate them. Um, but grass carp are definitely the most commonly misidentified species. And that led to us preparing uh, actually a manuscript and some outreach materials to assist with identification. So the most commonly reported size class that we see are what we call large juveniles and adults because black carp mature at fairly uh, large sizes in females. It's probably around a meter, males about 800 millimeters total length. Um, and the prior keys for grass carp and black carp identification always highlighted the use of pharyngeal teeth and external color. Now, pharyngeal teeth, as I mentioned before, those are fairly dense bones, and they're actually embedded in some of the most dense muscle tissue within the fish's body to be able to exert those bite forces. So there's a significant amount of effort that goes into being able to extract the teeth for identification, and there aren't many um, in the public or commercial folks that will want to go through that effort to be able to, to identify a fish. Also, um, coloration, I mentioned, is a, is a method, but that can vary with capture location. For example, you know, grass carp that have been collected in tannin-stained waters are usually commented as being darker in color than, than say, a more turbid system. 
Um, so we needed a method for a quick external identification and a, and a simple character set to, to help with that. So we went back and looked at a couple different options. One of them uh, is the anterior lateral line. So you can differentiate a black carp or black carp and a grass carp based on the, the shape of the anterior lateral line. And this is from the initial description of both species in that a grass carp uh, coming off of the operculum, it takes a dip towards the uh, pectoral fin ray and then continues straight along the length of the body on a black carp. As the scales, those lateral line scales leave from the operculum, they're nearly straight, take a dip around the dorsal fin and then continue nearly straight along the length of the body. Um, lateral head morphology is based on observations and reports from commercial fishers that initially collected black carp uh, in the Atchafalaya River system and reported that to Nico. Um, they said that black carp had a more pointed head or snout than grass carp, and that's how they were able to identify them. And you can see that here, we applied a trust network analysis with different points from the images that we had of wild caught fish. And the red arrow is the measurement for grass carp that shows that they had a deeper head at the preoperculum than black carp and black carp had a greater distance between the landmarks at the eye and the preoperculum, that yellow arrow there. So you can see that they do have a little bit more pointed head than grass carp, and that's based on the measurements in those regions. Also from a history of working with these species in, in culture and from various just prior research, we found that the visible presence of the premaxilla when viewed dorsally with the mouth fully closed was a, a good indicator. So on a grass carp, you can see in this image here, I have an arrow pointing it out that that premaxilla is very visible, that line. A lot of the images I had from my work are much darker, uh, and I was worried that you might not be able to see it from the contrast on the slides that I presented here. So I have this image from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I believe that's a, a tank fish. You can see fairly well with the lighting and everything else, that premaxilla. Um, these characters, uh, there, we saw some plasticity in them, and uh, obviously with lateral line scales, you know, scales in particular, those fish can lose a scale. So we recommend a combination of um, this character set when trying to identify fish. And the, the character set and the outreach materials that have been used to create it are available on basiccarp.us. I actually have the link to the, the PDF on the bottom of it right there that you can see if you're interested in that. So moving on to distribution, um, all these points are from our U.S. Geological Survey Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database, uh, and I've created this map for you. Um, you can see that the first record we have was from 1994 from that NAS database, but and that is an aquaculture escape, but there's actually a, a pretty heavy history of use in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. There just aren't any uh, documented escapes from those, those locations. Um, the first reported capture in the wild was from 2003, and I have an arrow pointing there. This is uh, Oxbow Lake at the middle Mississippi River. Um, and then again, I mentioned on the previous slide that uh, Nico's prior work with commercial fishers in the 1990s, um, those folks were down in the Atchafalaya and uh, lower Red Rivers. And they were some that mentioned undocumented commercial collections of black carp from those systems. I should also know that when I put together this map for you, it has kind of a, a timeline of 1999. So I want to point this out, 1994 all the way up to 2019, because on a later slide, I plan to highlight some of the more recent records. But um, a substantial number of these come from 2017, 2018 timeline, which I'll mention in a second. But um, black carp reporting was somewhat sporadic until 2015. That was a sort of a program by the state of Illinois, a bounty program. Um, for captures that were recorded in Illinois or adjacent states. And you can see how that's expressed by the, the density of points around the state of Illinois here. Um, during that time frame, we worked directly with commercial fisheries markets or commercial fishers down in the lower Mississippi. As I mentioned, again, lower Mississippi is this extent down here. We have the Atchafalaya River and the Red River coming in here. And that was in 2017, 2018. Our goal there was just to provide some base samples for the life history research that we were trying to do with the, um, within the previously described species range. So a recent change to that Illinois program beginning in 2021, 
Um, they expanded it a little bit. So it now encompasses, and this was the outreach document that I showed you before, but the Missouri, Upper Mississippi, Ohio, Cumberland, Tennessee River systems. And there's also continued um, work within the waters of the state of Illinois where it has been. And you know, with this, we kind of anticipate that uh, um, data will continue to be gathered on species distribution and uh, be able to continue ongoing life history research um, within the waters where consistent capture has occurred. And in the past, uh, you know, the commercial, most of the records that we get come from commercial fisheries. We've had some recreational fisheries and reporting, but typically it, it tends to come from commercial fisheries and kind of anticipate with this expansion, we should be hearing from more of those commercial fisheries. Uh, and this has been a good tool for monitoring the, the species range and range expansions um, within this basin. <clears throat> um, again, I wanted to highlight that the star, upper star here is confluence of the Missouri River. So upstream of that is the upper Mississippi, middle Mississippi is that stretch that goes down to uh, the confluence with the Ohio at this star here. And then downstream, we have lower Mississippi. So just in recent years, we've seen continued captures from waters of the state of Illinois um, within the Illinois River system, which is right here. And that is the connection through uh, to Chicago and the Great Lakes. We've seen uh, extent change to kilometer 310 and the Ohio River, 552 kilometers upstream. You can see the red, red points here uh, with some, some recent range expansion from the initial observations in Indiana. Um, the upper Mississippi River, we've kind of seen the extent near the vicinity of Keokuk, Iowa, um, Pool 20 hasn't uh, changed much in the past few years. Um, the Missouri River, most of these, these points, I mentioned that recreational capture here, most of these points are based on the effort of a single commercial fisher that's filled in some of those locations at that spot and continues to report um, and then I wanted to mention again, you know, that timeline 2017, 2018, you won't see any red or green dots from the lower Mississippi River or any of these systems because um, we have not worked down there since that time frame. So it's not that the fish are not present within those systems or being collected. It's just that there isn't an incentive, an incentive for people to report and they don't report. Um, so if we know that they're still there, we just haven't had any reports to fill in the gaps between those clusters. And then you probably notice looking at this map, this is an error, a GIS error. This is actually a, a single record from West Virginia and a PayPon system where the state identified black carbon we confirmed it based on an image. And we haven't had any more reports from that system or beyond that Mississippi River Basin. So checking back in with our timeline, I, I went all the way through distribution. You got an idea of background. So now we're kind of transitioning to what do we do as far as life history research with the samples that are retained from the wild caught fish? And then what are the specific laboratory and field research projects that we have ongoing? So as far as population parameters, this is a lot of what we learned from the life history research. We've had samples collected since 2009, even prior to that 2015 um, increase in samples. These have come from the wild and then processed for life history research. And that consists of determination of origin, population genetics, reproductive condition, aging growth, and diet. And I'm gonna follow a format on the next few slides. If it's in bold um, here, you know, these are topics that I plan to cover on the following slide in a little bit more detail. If it's not in bold, then I'll just briefly highlight that on the, on the slide that it's on. So I did wanna note, so within the population genetics, uh, where Rick Lance is working on an update um, to population level genetics from the samples that have been collected from the wild um, till recent times. There was an initial uh, population genetic study by Hunter and Nico, um, if you're interested in that topic and need to reference it. So this slide is basically a, a combination of all the information that was on the past one. So um, there's a manuscript that's in review that looks at origin and status of black carp in the wild. Basically it's um, by Greg Woodledge at Southern Illinois University um, and it's establishment of invasive black carp in the Mississippi River Basin, identifying sources and year classes contributing to recruitment. So this takes the otolith microchemistry from SIU, Floydy analysis from the Fish and Wildlife Service, reproductive development in the form of gonadosomatic index and age estimates 
through 2018 through us at CERP. And we combine that information to look at those uh, sources and year classes contributing to recruitment. So basically some of the conclusions from that wild black carp uh, primarily consists of fertile naturally reproduced fish. Uh, so non, non triploid fish. Um, we do see some introduced or escaped fish still present, but there's minimal detections of those fish, either from the otolith microchemistry or from floating analysis. Um, we've seen that reproduction has occurred in several rivers, multiple year classes of, from the otolith microchemistry, multiple year classes of wild fish are present and wild fish have recruited to adulthood. Okay. Um, so, one real quick. Moving on to ecological effects. Next, I have diet. Um, I will cover the, the diet research that we've done with large juveniles and adults on the next slide. Um, also know that one of Greg Whitledge's students uh, kind of in parallel to this was studying the isotopic niche of black carp. Um, we provided tissue samples for that from the wild carcasses. So we kind of looked at the diet of fish, this, the physical diet of fish at the same time as he was studying the isotopic niche. And uh, Hudman actually found that <clears throat> they have a fairly broad uh, niche based on his work. And it's similar to what we found from our, our diet work, our physical diet work as well. There's also uh, another manuscript I wanted to bring up, some recent work on young of year and juvenile feeding behavior done by the Illinois Natural History Survey. And they looked at the differential vulnerability of native and non-native mollusks, uh, particularly bivalves, um, to predation of juvenile, by juvenile black carp. And I mentioned that I wouldn't go into detail on it, but there has been some food web modeling done by the folks at NOAA. Um, and then again, this is a topic area when the binational risk assessment presentation is given at a later date. Um, if you're interested, please follow through. So as far as diet, I'm going to follow a format here where I have the, the citation to the manuscript in the upper right hand corner. So this is our first manuscript on diet, our first examination of diet items consumed by a wild caught black carp. And uh, sample size here was 109 black carp collected from 2009 to 2017. And some of the things that we found from this black carp Predominantly consumed benthic prey, native mussels and snails were present in the diet. Uh, corbicula and dracinids were present, but at a low percent incidence. Um, and then we found that they also uh, consumed insects in the form of mayflies, midges, and caddisflies. There was some evidence of flexibility in feeding modes. There's an example that I give here of the subimago um, stage of mayflies, and that's those are pictured here in this uh, collage of diet items. Um, there were other taxa that were also consumed that suggest, you know, uh, midwater column subsurface feeding. Um, and then we also saw local consumption of numerous item, items of a single taxa. So some of these samples of the gastrointestinal tract of black heart had um, numerous diet items. You know, snails is the example that I have in the image here. We also had coronamids uh, as well and a few other taxa. If you're interested, please follow through and look at the reference for more details. Um, we had a recent manuscript that came out. It pertains to the, the presence of this fluke. Um, fluke picture here is Betagaster contracola and its presence in the gastrointestinal tract of black carp. This is from the same pool of samples with some additional samples um, added over time. Basically, um, you know, the way we've studied diet is through these commercial captures. And with commercial capture, uh, you're dependent on the commercial fisher's gear to understand what that fish uh, consumed. And, and, and with that, you know, in particular, I'll, I'll get to this on a later slide, but uh, hoop nets are a common method for collection. And with hoop nets, they may be fished for 48 hours to 72 hours, depending on the market. There's some variation in, um, you know, methods that they fish, how they fish, where they set. But that gives the fish the opportunity to enter a net if it's at the start. It has time to evacuate its gastrointestinal tract, and it may not have any contents there. Another thing that we learned from tank studies on the species is that they may not necessarily consume every piece of a diet item that they ingest. And I'm referencing particularly bivalves or snails that they may be able to. Um, we've seen with corbicula that in tank studies that they'll engulf engulf the clam, break the clam with their pharyngeal teeth, and they can reject pieces of that shell. So they aren't necessarily ingesting all of it. And if, 
if you're familiar with muscle identification at times, you need to be able to have certain pieces of the shell to identify uh, a muscle down to species. So <clears throat> with all of that, we, we had some or a numerous amount of samples that uh, didn't have anything present in them other than these flukes. And the flukes are uh, a mollusk parasite. So they can be used as an indicator of prior mollusk consumption. And with that, we were able to, to look back and understand that the, the estimates and the uh, indicator of the importance of mollusks to the black carp diet may have been an underestimate from the initial study. Also, as you can see in this image, you know, there was uh, some implications for parasite dispersal because of these flukes within the gastrointestinal tract and the presence of gravid females. Um, so with this, we've transitioned research to kind of focus on the mollusk component a little bit more to understand the taxa that are being consumed and the habitats that they may potentially occupy or where they're coming from and what type of mollusks um, are being ingested. So um, we focus a little bit more on the presence of those. I do have here on the right-hand side the list of species that have been identified. A lot of our um, muscle work in particular with the diet is, again, based on physical identification and the, the requirement for the presence of the, the shell fragments that can be used to aid identification. So um, with that, a lot of times we do have to leave it at uni on a day. Um, you cannot identify beyond that. I uh, should mention also that with that expanded range, we do anticipate um, obviously a greater um, potential list of species that could be um, understood from the range of reports and potential range of mollusks and black carpus as those reports come in. So transitioning here to life cycle and some of the other points, I wanted to give you this background. So again, from Nico et al, uh, a great reference, reproduction occurs with an upstream migration in the main stem, spawning in free flowing waters. Egg development occurs with downstream drift. Spawning is in late spring and summer and it's stimulated by a rise in water level and water temperature. Larvae migrate to backwater areas where they develop and the, the young and juveniles develop in these areas as well. And then the main stem is used for feeding and wintering habitat by subadults and adults. So that all um, correlates with detection, understanding the distribution of the fish and the, the size of the fish. Um, the two topics I was going to cover here are environmental DNA, and physical capture, environmental DNA. Uh, and I won't expand on this too much, but obviously it's a tool being used by a lot of different uh, subject areas to understand uh, detection of different organisms. And it's been used for, for black carp as well. It's still being developed though. Um, Rick Lance and at US Army Corps of Engineers at URDIC and uh, Kathy Richter at my lab here have been studying it. Rick has uh, published on some, some assays for black carp in particular, and they've continued to do their field work and lab work pertaining to eDNA development of the species. As far as physical capture, um, there were some early pond studies on different methods for collection of black carp, electrofishing and phygnetting in particular. Um, there wasn't much, much success by those two methods in the field at this point, at the stages that they've focused on or the sizes that they focused on. Uh, I also wanted to mention that based on uh, an increase in commercial collections from a specific oxbow lake in the Mississippi River, there was one management action that was enacted. This, uh, this report here that I have, the Horseshoe Lake Incident Response in 2018, that did su successfully collect black carp by several different years. Um, within that effort. And then from our work with commercial fishers, um, we put together a summary of their reported capture methods, the specific gear dimensions, and I'll get into that in a later slide. Um, with that, though, I did want to mention that our colleagues at the Illinois Natural History Survey are doing some work of their own on capture on uh, the use of baited versus non-baited hoop nets, um, and then also enhanced detection of black carp in the the lower Illinois River, which is an area of interest. And then on later slides, I will get into the collection and identification of early life stages and what's been done um, with that. So um, there's minimal information available from the species native or other introduced ranges. Uh, again, I have the same format here. You can see the reference in the upper right hand corner to the, to the summary that we put together. Um, this is basically a uh, report of the capture data from the different gear dimensions that came from the commercial fishers that successfully collected and reported uh, black carp to us. 
So our objectives with this were to assess the course habitats, time of year, and methods of collection. The time frame is 2011 to very early in 2019. We looked at 302 records with specific gear dimensions. Um, size range of the fish is all the way from, from 400 to that largest 400 millimeters total length to the largest fish that I mentioned, the 1607 millimeter total length fish. But know that most of the records that we received during this time frame were the uh, around the 700 to 1,000 millimeter total length size. Um, and from this, we found that several gears collected black carp, specifically hoop nets and gill nets, and those were fished among main stem habitats and backwaters throughout the year. There is some seasonality to how those gears are fished, and that's represented also in the time of year that they uh, successfully collected black carp hoop nets. Set in May, June, and July were kind of the highest reported by that year. And then gill net catch was highest in November, January, and February. And that matches a pattern of effort where commercial fishers will um, more commonly fish hoop nets during the spring, summer months, warmer water temperatures, more active fish than in the, the winter when they tend to fish gill nets. Um, please note with this that data are dependent on commercial fishing effort and the catchability of gears. One thing, um, you know, in some of the states in the U.S., uh, commercial harvest is restricted in tributaries. Uh, they're kind of set to focus on their efforts in the main stem, larger systems. Um, and collection and those records are dependent on the distribution of, of effort. And like I mentioned, a lot of our reports come in from commercial fishers in the past uh, two years. I've seen a few more reports by hook and line anglers, but not many. Um, most, most still are commercial collections. So that said, tributaries are an area where we could learn a little bit more just based on that lack of effort and information that comes in. And I wanted to point out one thing when I say, when I say gill nets, there is the use commonly of this tied down gill net, which is uh, a gill net set to a slightly shallower depth than it would fish if it was fully stretched. And that creates a little bit of a bag. It doesn't act fully like a trammel net, but it, it creates a little bit of bag and leads to a little bit of enhanced capture according to the commercial fishers. And they, they commonly use that for several species. So with that information, we've moved to target black carp on our own. Um, we use hoop nets, as I mentioned, in May, June, and July, and we've done that in 2020 and 2021. And our goal with this research, I don't have any early results to report. We have successfully collected black carp. Um, we've focused on a, an area of increased capture at the confluence Missouri and Mississippi River systems. And we're trying to understand the environmental covariates that lead to capture, such as depth, current velocity, river stage, and water temperature that facilitate that capture. And some of the point of our efforts are to also um, facilitate telemetry research um, through the acquisition of fish and the surgical implant of transmitters for that work. So on this slide, I have our telemetry research, which we're just trying to understand the habitat use and movement of fish. Um, basically, I mentioned how a lot of what we understand is dependent on that commercial fishery, commercial effort, capture, and uh, Tagged fish provide information about habitat use and behavior independent of the fish, you know, how, how different gears fish and how someone goes out and fishes. So um, also independent of catchability. So again, we're focusing most of that initial capture and tagging effort at the confluence of Missouri and Mississippi rivers. Um, and that's an area of increased commercial capture. Majority of our data have been collected by active tracking. And the, uh, the distribution of our telemetry effort has changed and been dependent on fish movement. We initially kind of started around this confluence region, as you can see by the dense points, but we've expanded our range down, downstream, upstream, and several systems uh, to be able to, to gather that data based on the behavior of our fish. So we, we do work with several partners on this, the Corps of Engineers, other colleagues at USGS, the state of Missouri, Missouri Department of Conservation, and uh, they manage receiver arrays as well as us. I don't have those plotted on this map here, but um, we do work together on a fairly large effort and assist with other telemetry studies as well. Um, just some initial observations. We've seen some intermittent use of tributaries by individuals. We've seen some site fidelity by individuals relative uh, to main stem habitats. They may be tagged in an area. They tend to occupy it. Um, they may disperse for a brief time. Um, to another habitat and then return back or another area several miles away and then return back to that same area and occupy it for a fairly consistent time frame. 
Um, we've seen dispersal that's occurred upstream um, in the Missouri River, as I have pictured here. Um, I mentioned the tributaries. This is a, the blue circle is the Osage River again. We've seen use by one fish and intermittent use by another. Um, we've seen dispersal upstream through one dam during open river conditions. I should mention that the Mississippi and Missouri rivers are both exhibit seasonal changes in the hydrograph and uh, flood events. Um, and based on that, we say open river conditions are when the, the different gates on that dam are fully open. So it presents more of a, at high water, more of an open river, more accessible condition. And that's when we saw dispersal upstream in the upper Mississippi. So with this study, um, we'll get a better understanding of habitat use, obviously. Also some of the post-tagging behavior and movement that we anticipate will assist with potential future seasonal research. And then uh, also understanding of the general broad scale movement patterns of the fish. So onto the early life stages, I haven't, I've kind of focused on the large juvenile adults throughout most of this. And that's because we don't have a whole lot of reports of the early life stages. Um, very little reporting. As far as collection records, no eggs or larvae have been collected. Uh, I know ichthyoplankton surveys are fairly consistently run by in the Illinois River, by the Illinois Natural History Survey. In uh, Louisiana, there's been a several year long study ongoing in the Atchafalaya, Mississippi, Ochita, and Red Rivers, and they haven't detected black carp. Um, as far as age zero fish, so a slightly larger stage, um, and I have some, some pictured here on the right in this slide. Um, we did see consistent reports from 2015 to 2018 um, by Wes Sleeper for the Missouri Department of Conservation during his tenure with the agency. Um, that's the upper image on the right there is kind of the size class that, that he targeted. It was late summer, typically. And then we have a single collection from Gar Creek in the Ohio River in Kentucky in 2018 by Kentucky biologists. Both of those are floodplain habitats of large rivers in the Mississippi River Basin. They're actually fairly close to each other. I wanted to provide for you, um, oh, jumped ahead one. Just an idea where these are. You can see Dutchtown Ditch is, uh, is basically kind of an agricultural ditch uh, adjacent to the floodplain. This is the Mississippi River here. This is the Ohio River here. These are at different scales, by the way, just screen captured. This is Gar Creek. And you can see that this is the confluence of the uh, Mississippi and Ohio rivers are somewhat in, in close uh, proximity to each other. So just give you an idea, these are again floodplain uh, habitats of both of those systems. Um, we also have a record from this uh, diversion channel here as well. So this is certainly a life stage that we can study more and understand uh, better. I just completed some sampling uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service on a lab study to potentially use electrofishing for uh, inducing capture prone response of juvenile black carp from the 700, 70 millimeter to 500 millimeter total length size class. Um, and we see that that may be a potential method for sampling these floodplain tributaries of large rivers. Uh, also biologists in Kentucky within the next year will be attempting to sample the lower Ohio River to collect juvenile black carp as well. So <clears throat> again, we've not seen eggs or larvae collected. Uh, we're working to develop methods to study early life stages though. Um, one of the things that we need to understand better is characterization of black carp egg and larvae development. And it's necessary to inform drift models to better understand recruitment dynamics and improve identification and validation of larval black carp where recruitment does occur. Um, we've been a little bit limited by this due to the lack of availability in aquaculture to, to acquire broodstock fish. I mentioned before the black carp mature at large sizes. Uh, females, you're looking at about a meter total length. That's a fairly large fish for aquaculture operations and late ages from the aquaculturist that we've spoken to. We know that you know six to seven years is about the timeline for a fish to uh, mature in the ponds. Um, I've been working with several states on this to try and acquire broodstock for, for spawning and development of this research in our biosecure facility at our lab. Um, we've worked with commercial fishers to, to get the fish um, and, and states to permit through that. Uh, this is an example of the FLUEG model here, just to give you an idea of the drift model that data could be incorporated into. So moving on to controls, um, I plan to talk a little bit more in the next slide about toxic bait development and the work that I've done. Uh, just know that other technologies and development by USGS have not been um, uh, have not been studied on this species in particular. 
um, you know, within the existing deterrent and attractant technology, the one that I'm aware of as far as acoustic deterrents, there's a, a thesis that I have listed here um, that I believe Mary Beth Bray helped on, but Black Harp were included in the hearing threshold and impact of anthropogenic noise, but that's about the extent. Um, I, you know, other deterrent and attractant technology consists of, again, acoustics, carbon dioxide, electric barriers, the bioacoustic fish fence, if you're not familiar, is a combination of an air bubble curtain, acoustic stimuli, and light uh, as a deterrent. And then there is also the development of the oblique bubble screens. So for the bait development work that we've done, uh, the goal was to develop a single dose um, isocide species specific bait for black carp. Um, so there's, there's kind of two options for pisocides at this point. Uh, anamycin A or rotenone. Anamycin A was chosen for its toxicity at lower doses than rotenone in, in early testing. Um, we anticipated, if successful, that the application for this would be for protection of specific endangered muscle beds, so kind of a targeted effort and not necessarily the broad spectrum control that you might think of with other uh, pesticide applications. Um, and we chose a certain design for this. Um, we have not been successful at producing that single dose species specific bait. We did develop a few things. We developed a delivery method that consists of a live mollusk uh, attractant. You can see that picture here with the curricula. And uh, this is the fully assembled, sorry, this is the fully assembled bait here. Um, and uh, anticipated that a, a fish would see the search image of that live mollusk. You know, the live mollusk feeds, excretes, kind of represents the scent, the search image of a diet item, and hopefully would be interacted with um, more regularly than maybe a food-based product. Also, um, taking this approach over alternatives, the pisocide is retained in a glass ampule um, because anamycin A degrades by hydrolysis. So with a low density uh, black heart population, we anticipated we needed that ampule to be able to have a treatment out for a longer amount of time to interact with our target species. We also did some forage um, size preference testing with the corbicula, and we looked at in just the toxicity of anamycinated black carp and grass carp. Um, and uh, the results of the grass carp work are actually being implemented in the development of uh, baits for that species at this point. And with that, I'm back to kind of my, my summary um, and my outline, and I, I just hope that you were able to take something useful about the uh, black carp in general, their status in the United States, and uh, this summary of research. And with that, I wanted to thank our funding sources, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources assistance with uh, collecting black carp, and then uh, these numerous um, agencies that have assisted throughout with all of this work. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, particularly enjoyed when you had the, uh, the teeth bones. That was really great to see. Um, nice to get a visual uh, and, and amazing the size of them. So that was, uh, that was great. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in, but please feel free to add any more um, if, if you think of any as we're, we're speaking. Um, but the first one that came in, um, somebody is wondering what the closest capture to the Great Lakes, um, Michigan, and how far um, from the Great Lakes is the closest known reproducing population of black carp? Um, let me see if I can bump back a slide for you. Probably easier to show than to tell. So, For sure. Um, so on this slide, I mentioned the Illinois River and the extent of um, Lake in Illinois. So this is 310 kilometers upstream from the confluence of the Mississippi. I believe, and I had to measure this myself, the distance may be off, but I believe it's a little over 200 kilometers um, from the Great Lakes at that point. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I guess on, on our side, not the best news, but, um, but yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of the next question, we thought uh, somebody had said that they read a recent newspaper article citing that a merchant in Michigan area perhaps 
um, I'm not sure, was fined about $15,000 for selling invasive carp meat. Um, they're wondering if there's any interest to aggressively harvest invasive carp for such uses, and which would then also act as a control mechanism. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Um, I don't quite understand the question. Um, you know, there are markets that exist for silver carp, um, and there's a decent amount of commercial fishing and, and various programs to use commercial fishing as a control of silver carp. At this point, we don't see um, a lot of black carp uh, reported enough to have a market. Um, you know, that Illinois program is kind of the closest thing that approaches that, where it's, it's getting the word out there about the presence of the species and it provides, it promotes, you know, provides a method to, to harvest and report. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll just, I'll go in chronological order if that works. Okay, <laughs> so we might be jumping around a bit on, on the topics. <laughs> um, um, somebody was, was wondering if they might have missed it, but um, are there only sterile fish being tagged and released? Um, if, only feral fish? Sterile, sorry, sterile. Sterile fish? No, we use, we use wild fish. Um, mm. they're, not, they're not sterile. Mm. Um, so we don't introduce triploid fish for, for that work. Okay. Um, uh, next, is there any evidence of black carp consuming faucet snails? Faucet snails. Uh, I don't believe we've seen that in any of our samples, and I'm not familiar with faucet snails from any prior research. Okay. If they want to follow up and ask, I'm going to bump this back here. Here. It's my last slide. There's my email address too. If somebody has a specific question about past work or anything um, similar to that, you know, they're welcome to email and I can follow up as well. Sure. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you for, for adding that. And likewise, uh, on our end as well, um, Invasive Species Center, we can try to um, respond to, to anything as well. Um, so, so the next question, um, is somebody said the excellent talk. <laughs> um, <Thanks>. So <laughs> is, uh, is tagging and releasing black carp contributing to their spread and impacts? Uh, is there not enough published study, studies documenting their biology um, and impacts to justify removing all captured black carp to prevent their movements towards an introduction to the Great Lakes. So a few, few parts to that one. Yeah, there, there really isn't a lot of information from the species native range to be able to understand the distribution of the fish. And with what we can learn from tagging a few individuals, we can understand better how to develop control methods and how to collect, to like collect fish to have an impact. Um, and yeah, in the area that we have focused our work is an area where we see increased reports in commercial captures in general. So we know that there's fish there. We just don't understand fully how to collect them, how to control them and potential impacts because it's so dependent on those commercial fisheries, which within a reach may be only a few fishers and their range may vary seasonally based on whatever market they're targeting. A lot of the markets we see are either buffalo, catfish, there's um, some grass carp, some silver carp, but a lot of it is the native fish and, you know, small kind of local markets and effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I guess kind of related to, to that and uh, related to the question before on um, specific type of uh, snails, um, if they ing invade the Great Lakes, will they eat zebra mussels? Um, and have you involved uh, another Part to this question, but have you involved uh, First Nations with this program since they are unable to uh, fish in length using gill nets and could be part, of, they could be a great aid to the program, uh, uh, this person's written. So, sorry, yeah, um, two-parter again. <laughs> that's okay. For your first part about zebra mussels, that's a pretty common question, and I, that's why I put it in there, you know, with that initial um, study on diet, we did see that zebra mussels are present in the diet. Um, but it's a low percent incidence among the samples. We do continue. So with the transition of diet research, we are focusing more on mollusks. So any sample that contains shell fragments, um, we continue to retain those for identification. And we're going to look at what the, that, if that percent incidence changes over time with the samples that we have or within a specific reach or area. The goal there is to understand 
uh, you know, potentially impacted unionid muscles, but also that invasive component as well. Um, so they do consume um, zebra mussels, but it's not, um, they aren't specifically targeting them. If that, mm -hmm. um, and then to the question about First Nations and their fisheries, um, I, it sounds like within the, the region that you're, you're talking about, they have some special regulations and ability to, to go out and target fish. And that's, um, that's a little bit different than the area where we've kind of focused. And that, that's more of a management action as well. I don't, um, we just try to study based on, um, you know, what actions are being taken by the states. And uh, as far as the control component, you know, we kind of develop the controls. Um, yeah, not have not, um, and most of what I've done has been related to working with those commercial fishers and existing markets and fisheries. For sure, yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. This the same person has also asked just in terms of feeding, um, are are black carp able to be used into um, supplemental usage like livestock feed, uh, dog and cat feed? Is that something that, that's been explored? Um, um, so again, the species is not, it's not really collected in the density that you would need to have a market like that at this, at this point. Okay. Yeah, but it has been studied as a food fish within the native range and other introduced ranges, sorry. Great. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I have heard that before um, with, with grass carp, I think, but uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's interesting with, with black carp, it differs a little bit. Um, so do black carp have any close uh, native analogs similar to, with, um, sorry, species with very similar niches um, that they're thought to be directly competing with? Is that, uh, is that something you've looked into? Yeah, so that's, we're not really at the point to be able to say that. You know, that's kind of where the diet research falls is just trying to understand what niche they fill. Mm. Um, with, with Hudman's thesis, they looked at, um, I believe, blue catfish, freshwater drum. We thought there, they thought that there would be kind of an overlap there. Um, and the, the freshwater drum and the, the blue catfish, I think, ordinated separately. They had kind of their own different sections. And then if you look at the ellipse for black carp, it was a much larger ellipse that, that coincides with what I was saying is a, a broader niche. And that's kind of what we saw from the physical diet as well. They have that fairly broad niche. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we're, we're just getting a couple comments in as well, uh, based on some of our earlier conversation on um, black carp being rare, <laughs> um, rare captures. Um, but maybe we'll, we'll stick to maybe one more question just in the interest of time. Um, yeah. Sure. So um, somebody has asked if their maturation is so late, shouldn't it be reasonable to think that they could be over harvested easily? I guess that kind of goes against what, uh, what we just mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, they, they do mature at a fairly late and large size. It's just understanding how to collect, how to collect the fish is, a, is difficult. That's kind of the stage that we're at. For sure. For sure. Um, well, thank you so much. <laughs> um, we really appreciate a lot of lot of questions there. So thank you so much for to the audience for participation. And um, if we didn't get to your question, or if you have any further questions, as Patrick mentioned, his contact information is on the screen, fortunately, um, and ours is uh, is available on our website. Um, and so yeah, with with that, um, just would like to say again, thank you for presenting. This webinar will be recorded and posted on our website at Asian Care carpcanada.ca um, and the invasive species um, center.ca as well. So uh, just a reminder to also take the survey at the end of um, this webinar as well. If you could do that, we would really appreciate it. So thanks so much again and uh, take care. Thank you.